Thank you very much for having me here today. And, and it is a, a very uh, important presentation and it's a pertinent subject, something that is secretly growing and growing. Um, in some cases, it's come to a place now where it just can't be ignored, especially within our community. And as Sheikh Asad Mensin mentioned, it is one of the taboo subjects. However, um, it is becoming more dominant now in, within the community and it really needs addressing. So just before we kind of jump into the presentation, I'm just going to introduce myself. Uh, I know Sheikh Asad has given a bit of a, uh, you know, he has told you all a bit about me. Uh, but my name is Nadeem. Uh, I am um, I work for High Level Northern Trust. So I'm one of the recovery workers there. I am a trained therapist, so um, I work in psychotherapy. Um, I also kind of not only just work with the substances, but also the kind of underlying causes that might be there. So with mental health, uh, which is kind of more my area of work. Um, why the presentation? Why am I actually out in the community? Because uh, what I love is my therapy room, and that's all one-to-one -one work. Um, these presentations where I have lots of people is something quite new to me. Um, however, I have been kind of sent out into the community from the organisation. Uh, partly because there was a big demand, and there's been um, quite a lot of... Um, it's been quite important for the com for the organisation to reach out into the community because there has been people that have been speaking to us about the addiction, um, but we're very very reluctant to actually engage because of some of the stigmas that are attached. Uh, and we'll talk about this in the later part of the presentation. But there's three things that I intend uh, from the presentation. One uh, at the beginning, I'm going to be kind of touching on mental health slightly. Um, and it's just to kind of raise an awareness why our mental health is important. Uh, but at the same time, where does substance abuse actually come in to the, to the equation? Because when our mental health is not taken care of, we actually become, we have heightened vulnerability. Uh, and this is where we can become prone to towards substances or other unhelpful coping strategies. Um, same thing at the same time is people that are actually, you know, in the process where they're using substances, what help is available to them and also to their family and loved ones because it's very, very challenging to have someone who's actually destroying themselves through using substances. Uh, it's, you know, it's very difficult and it's, it's important that they have some sort of su support available to them. Um, and thirdly, as a preventative towards other people as well, that is not really an option um, to go down because although substances might give moments of relief but there's always pain and anguish that's always behind them so we'll kind of jump into the presentation um, and it's kind of looking at what mental health is so our mental health is basically it includes our emotional psychological our social well-being humans are social animals um, you know we understand we develop in the world through interaction you know by interacting with others the world around us we learn we develop we grow when that's in a healthy manner, um, we feel good, you know, uh, we, we feel, we act, we behave good. Uh, the way our relationships, they thrive, we, good, we develop in the areas of our work, you know, and we just kind of ebb and flow with life in a, in a very positive manner. The model of, of therapy that I use, CBT mainly, um, it has a, what you call a, an interactive model, and it shows that circumstances always impact us so we have a circumstance because of that circumstance then we have thoughts we have emotions we have physiological symptoms or feelings in our bodies and behaviors so we kind of go through this whole process and we get caught up in these patterns so when our mental health is good and we do things that we look after ourselves we behave act feel in a very positive and good manner so the importance of our mental health is this, is that mental health it affects everything. Um, you know, if we are in a good place, we learn to cope again. We can cope with difficult situations, adverse life circumstances. We feel healthy in all of our aspects. We start prioritizing ourselves in many ways. Uh, our relationships, they prosper, you know. Uh, we become involved with families, communities. You know, we're more productive at our work in, in every, every kind of aspect of our lives. So mental health is a very, very important thing. Now, the world has been 
quite, you know, over the last couple of years at least, things have been quite crazy, especially with COVID and things that have been going on. Um, these are kind of statistics that are before that, but we can see that there's, you know, people that struggle with their mental health, uh, there is, is quite high and it's growing as well. So it's kind of one in five adults with a mental illness around uh, just over 10 million people uh, over the age of 18 that have a addiction and a mental health disorder. And this is growing. This, this statistic is quite old. But looking over at um, some of the new ones that I've seen, like in 2018, there was uh, statistics on um, antidepressants and their usage, and they've rocketed, uh, you know. And although antidepressants might be used in different kind of things as well, but it just shows that their usage has gone so so much more and it's continuing to grow as well especially since it's what we had over the last couple of years going through covid times was very very challenging um, people kind of suffered a lot of losses you know financial financial loss people lost their jobs um, the services around pretty much in the uk we all know what the state of the nhs is and, and what's going on but the kind of organizations that deal with mental health it's been really really tough uh, and the reason why is the referrals have been coming in and you know they're very very difficult to to deal with the demand uh, that's being put on them uh, as a therapist you know sometimes we have to make referrals into the organizations and I know there's been clients that have been struggling with trauma um, we refer them in nine months down the line they might get seen so you know that's how much they can wait For someone who's taking a substance okay and he's struggling with his mental health nine months is a long time you know um, addiction is a very difficult area to work in and the reason why is the simple bottom line is this is people die you know one wrong over this and they're dead so you know it's the the, the the kind of situation has been really tough so support has been very very limited in these times and people have been going through difficult times and what's been happening is we have common presentations, common people coming in. So we've seen depression cases rise, loads of people coming in. Depression, anxiety is very common anyway. In fact, we're living in times where we've got the highest level of anxiety in, in uh, even uh, adolescents as well. You know, so it's, it's kind of growing really badly. Trauma cases coming in. I mean, uh, through the COVID times, we know that people were losing loved ones that they didn't even get to see. Okay, So there's key issues around bereavement, uh, trauma that people had. Uh, that they're struggling with eating disorders okay people being not not being used to isolation um, sometimes people were living alone they were coming into organizations it was the only kind of places that they had they're all of a sudden being forced into isolation somewhere where they didn't want to do didn't want to be comfort eating gaining masses of weight struggling with that but one of the things that also happened was addictive behaviors you know it was strange but when things happened in lockdown and people were stockpiling you heard about people stockpiling all sorts of stuff. I'm not going to go into it. But all sorts of stuff. But one thing that happened as well is they started stockpiling substances, you know, drugs and all sorts. And the problem that happened is when they had so much availability of substances, they used them really quickly, quickly than they normally did. Um, so what happens with substances is this is your body's tolerance levels grows. So if a person normally, you know, kind of be influenced by a certain amount, like just say cannabis, if it's 10 pound cannabis, eventually you come to the point where your body kind of gets used to it and then you need 20 pound. And then you, you get used to that and then you need to go to 30 pound to get the same kind of feelings. And you know, they've, they've stockpiled all of these kind of things and basically used them all. Um, so it's been kind of really difficult in the, in the sense that people have been using more and more substances. So when you have kind of problems like this, people generally trying to deal with the situation and they develop what they call coping strategies. Sometimes it's just kind of denial or avoidance. I'm not depressed. You know, there's nothing wrong with me or I don't want to know, you know, but they shut down, withdraw. Um, they can be kind of trying to distract themselves, just overworking, you know, not, wanna, not wanting to acknowledge what's going on. It can be kind of spending... But one of the things is, and this is where substance misuse comes in, is substance misuse is sometimes, uh, it's, a, it's an unhelpful coping strategy. People normally use substances for two reasons. One is to kind of heighten pleasures if they're having a good time, they want to feel better, they'll use substance. It'll give them the confidence to do whatever they want to do. Um, 
And the other one is to dull pain. So if things are too difficult and people can't tolerate, or the individual can't tolerate, they use substance to dull pain. And substance is one of them things, it's a quick fix in kind of, uh, in, a t in a way, you know, it will dull the pain. And for as long as the effects last, the individual's okay. However, it's kind of bringing attention to the fact that addicts always wake up to the same problems. You know, actually, before I was going to when I was going to start this presentation, I was going to say something, and I think I just it just went out of my mind. But you know, just one thing I want to kind of mention is the presentation is not about slating addicts, although I'm going to use the term. Um, it's not about slating addicts. Okay, um, it's kind of bringing the light onto addiction itself. Uh, we we se separate the addict from the from the actual addiction, because the addict is just a human. Uh, you know. Um, He's someone that's just struggling through life, in a sense. Um, and people use it for various different reasons. Um, and as human, humans make mistakes. However, addiction does have, is, what is a very difficult area to talk in because addiction is one of them things that leaves victims in its wake. You know, it will, it destroys the addict, number one, but it will destroy everything around him. Because an addict will pretty much do anything to feed his addiction and he will hurt a lot of people in the process. However, we're not, I'm not here to kind of, you know, judge the person, the individual. They are human and they need support. When a person gets to the point of dependency, um, it's either do or die. It's, it's just as simple as that. However, the addictions are kind of used as quick fixes, but what it does is it draws a person in more and more. So what is substance misuse? So it's kind of the use of any psycho substance, uh, psychoactive substance in a harmful way. And it's hazardous to health. And this can be things like alcohol, it can be illicit dro uh, drugs, it can glue, gases, uh, it can even be prescribed medication. Now, there's something that's actually going around in, in um, the organizations. I mean, gases are very quite common. You've probably heard of balloons, you've probably seen people taking them. You see these little silver canisters all over the place. Um, they've actually started selling them in, in massive big bottles now. Uh, so they're becoming available. They are blue bottles, so just keep an eye out for them. But, you know, when you have something of that quantity and people using them, and, you know, they're just as harmful. People just think that, no, it's not a problem. Um, they, they are very, very harmful and they do cause, long-term use will cause masses of problems. So this is just something that they're putting out. Just keep an eye out for them. Um, so people, they use substances regardless of its consequence, you know. A lot of people, uh, as Sheikh mentioned before, okay, they know that it will eventually kill them. But you know, no addict goes into a, an addiction with the thought in his head that I'm going to become dependent on this. They just use it for that instant and they think, well, when I want to, I'll use it. When I don't want to, I'll leave. But that transition from using, using to dependency is so subtle sometimes that the person doesn't know it. Once he's stuck in it, he's stuck in it. And then coming off it is an absolute nightmare. Recovery is a very tough journey. Um, so this is just a bit about substance misuse. But why is it important, you know, um, why are we here? Is it just the individual's problem? Um, you know, is it just the problem of that individual or does it impact us all? And the reality is, is it does impact every single one of us. I mean, it's bad for the individual, why? Because it exasperates any kind of mental illnesses that they have, okay? It causes breakdowns in families and relationships. We hear it all the time. Um, couples squabbling and arguing over things because of stuff that's been going on absolutely destroys the family structure. Um, financial distress, okay, because you know people will, like I mentioned, sometimes when when a person becomes dependent, they will do some quite horrible things to fund the addiction, uh, and it can cause a lot of financial distress. Uh, it damages brain activities, health, and all, eventually it leads to death. There's only one group where addiction goes, you know. Um, yeah, it gives a little, but it takes a lot. It might give temporary relief. However, what it does is it takes, and it takes without, you know, it doesn't stop. It will take the person's health, it will take his wealth, it will take his family, it will take his kids, it will take his job, it will take his finances, and eventually it will take his life. Uh, and that's where it ends, if it's not stopped. Um, but it's a societal problem, and it is a very collective problem. Collective uh, problem because there's a massive impact on society uh, you know there's obviously there's crimes that are related to to drugs um, 
does the economic aspects if you're a business owner you know or even you know losses of jobs and finances for people um, damage to the environment the impact it has on the younger generation we'll talk about this uh, but there's a burden on healthcare, on, on health costs as well. The problem with substance is this, is that it's a, it's a glamorized world. You know, it looks good from the outside. Um, you know, one of the things like, I mean, not all, of, not all substances are, are prohibited. The alcohol, for, for instance, is illegal in the UK. Whenever you see an advert of alcohol, you'll see a guy with a pint and he's smiling. You know, it's always kind of associated in that good way. And same thing with some, some of the things that have happened within... Um, like the movie industry and stuff like this, the life looks nice, you know, with drugs and alcohol. Uh, it looks nice and people get sucked into it, but it's not that. Um, the life of alcohol on drugs is one that's kind of marred in many, many deceptions, lies, stealing, ducking and diving, hiding, you know, there's all sorts of things that go on. Um, and it's a temporary, it does offer temporary relief, but it's very, very temporary. And when it does catch up with people, it has significant impact. If you look at violent crimes, things like there's a lot of cases of domestic violence or just normal violence, look at grooming, human trafficking, sexual exploitation, anything like this, you'll see drugs and alcohol somewhere inside that. It's linked to some of the worst things that you can. And people that actually come into it actually get pulled into these in one way or another. So it starts off from somewhere and it pulls them into something else. But it does that does impact us all. So it's not just an individual's problem. It is a collective problem and it's a problem for the whole of society that we need to tackle. Because we don't know who's going to get sucked into it, who's going to be the next person, who's going to be the next victim. So why we need to tackle the issue? It destroys lives, ruins families, tears apart communities. Tragic impact on people's livelihoods, okay? There's all of these things that happen, um, you know, that it cost loads, millions, it costs the, the economy millions as well. Um, one of the things that Sheikh Hasid mentioned is the, the topic of it being taboo. And this is something that's uh, a big problem. Um, we have had people coming, wanting help and then withdrawing. And the reason why is because of how they're going to get judged, you know. Um, what if it comes out into the community? But the problem is now it's coming to a point where there's so much being of it being done. There's so many people being caught up into it. It's something that can't hide. You walk down the street and you can smell cannabis. You know, it's, it's essentially a drug, you know. Um, so what is stigma and why is it important that we deal with this and look at it in a new way? Now, one of the reasons why I mentioned about mental health and that link between substance misuse is this, is sometimes addiction, okay, it's not all just about you know, the glamour, the glory, it's not all about having fun. Sometimes it's just about people trying to make it, make their, get to the end of their, their day. When I've worked in addiction, I mean, you have this, this kind of preconceived notions about addicts and what they do. But when you start talking to some of them, you'll find that they've had some of the toughest lives that you could imagine. Um, and they'll say to you themselves that if it wasn't for my addiction, I wouldn't be here today. I would have killed myself a long time ago. So sometimes, you know, the addiction comes in a place where it's a person's last attempt just to just to survive. Um, but the kind of stigma attached to it, the judgments attached to it, obviously they're not. Addiction is all about, or recovery is all about um, responsibility and accountability. So we don't validate the, the addict in any way, but we do need to understand where he's coming from. And that means just reserving judgments against them until you've actually heard why they do it. Um, but the stigma, it could be through the physical appearance, because, you know, what happens to them or the way when the mental health goes down, people just stop looking after themselves. Uh, you know, prolonged usage can make a, a young man look old very quickly. Um, but, you know, there's other things within our community around personal reputation, okay? What I mentioned about actually coming to services like this, we need to change maybe an attitude towards it. Sometimes it could just be prescribed medication, but if someone comes to the door, you know, he's kind of concerned that, well, well what if they think I'm, I'm doing alcohol or something else? It might just be painkillers that he's addicted to, but an addiction is an addiction. And even them, they will eventually take the toll on that person. Um, 
And a lot of the times the stigma is through actually telling people what's happened to them. Now, like I mentioned, some of the stories that you hear in, uh, while you work in the services are some of the most harrowing stories that you can ever imagine. And sometimes they stem from childhood, absolutely not, no fault of the individual themselves. But the way that things unfold for them is so intolerable that they turn to substances. So, you know, if we do actually know people in our community or if people come, in, come to us, you know, we need to change the way we actually deal with this situation. And more specifically, especially within the women, the women folk. Now, one of the things that's been coming through, and there's actually studies being pushed out now as well, is the limited support for women in the South Asian community uh, for substances. Um, what generally tends to happen, and it's quite unfortunate, is you might be young, impressionable women who are, who are kind of looking towards their future, get caught into relationships, think that they can help the man, um, get caught into the addiction, and once they're into the addiction, then there's all sorts of exploitation that happens. We live in the world where social media, camera phones is the norm, okay? Things, get, things happen, and then there's things like blackmail and all sorts that go on. Um, now, for some of these ladies, they don't, they can't actually come out for the support because of what goes on within the, the community. I mean, there's already we've been judged for many things, but you know, there is, um, there is this kind of uh, whole Im stigma around the women that is probably a lot, lot more than the men, you know, multiple times more. Uh, and it's about kind of opening the up and getting them the support that they actually need. Um, so one of the things that we can do is just kind of, you know, offer compassionate support to people because, you know, as a community, we're supposed to stand together. You know, a lot of these things, what happens is when they seep into the community, um, they get passed down. So if it's the father that's addicted to substances and his kids are seeing him, more than likely what will happen is, is it gets passed on to the kids and it gets dealt with. And especially in the women folk, because they're such a vital part of the community, because they bear you the part of the community, it definitely needs to be... Um, you know, kind of looked into. So just kind of offering compassionate support, just being kind, you know, uh, to people, uh, especially the ones that are in vulnerable situations. You know, withholding that judgment, at least listening to someone, you know, rather than, oh, you smell of alcohol and what are you doing here? Why are you actually drinking the alcohol? What's going on for you? Uh, you know, just kind of uh, withholding that judgment just for a short while, just to actually listen to the individual. Um, and this is one of the reasons, the next one is one of the reasons why I actually mentioned uh, you know, we're not slating the addict, okay, but we're kind of looking at the addiction is just seeing the person for who they are, they're just a normal human. They're not uh, immune to, to life. Uh, they make bad choices and they get pulled in, but humans are not always perfect. Um, so sometimes it happens and they get caught up into this world. The other thing is, is learning about drug dependency. You know, <laughs> I hate this so often. And I speak to people in the community and they say, oh, he, he, he's, he's, you know, he's always drinking alcohol. Why doesn't he just stop? You know, and the reason why sometimes they can't stop is because if they stop, they're dead. Um, you know, especially, you know, I've, when I actually came into this, I just thought drugs are the worst thing on the, on the face of the earth. I didn't think anything of alcohol, you know, because it's legal, isn't it, in the UK? I didn't think anything of it, but uh, alcohol uh, dependency is probably... It's probably akin to something like heroin, you know, it's that bad. Once a person is dependent on alcohol, you know, if they don't have it, they're prone to seizures, they more than likely will die. It needs to be reduced and then it needs to be eliminated. So people sometimes when they're on certain substances, they can't just stop. You know, and uh, uh, the way I see an addiction is like a man with a crutch, you know, and he's, he's using this crutch to get along. If you pull the crutch away from him, more than likely he's just going to fall flat on his face. It needs to be replaced with something, and one of the things, one of the ways that is doing that happens is by upskilling the person and teaching them healthier coping strategies. What that essentially does is improve the person's situation, and it, you know it makes conducive environments, and and it and it um, kind of benefits communities as a whole. Um, so the other thing is just kind of not avoiding kind of hurtful labels and stuff, but kind of looking into this. One of the reasons of coming in and speaking about it is just to build that awareness around it. So, the organisation I work for, High Level Northern Trust, okay, it's been operational for 20 years in Rochdale. And you know where it is? It's on Drake Street, Champness Hall. It's just right around the corner from here. Um, when I actually came in, most of the, the people that would, would come in, they were all Caucasian, white people, you know. It's very limited 
from the interaction from, from our own community. Although there's been calls for it and, and people coming in, but they've just dropped off because of what they felt would happen if people found out that they were accessing a service. Um, the service is it's a brilliant service, to be honest with you, okay? It's a service that's open to all. It's not specifically just for Muslims. It's just for everyone, anyone and everyone. Um, you know, the, the ethos is just want to help people, and there's a very, very nice people in there, a brilliant team that they have. Um, they're very understanding, okay, they're aware of cultural issues and everything. Um, they're trained to do that. Um, the, organi the organization is a confidential organization. However, confidentiality does have its limitations, okay? Um, and it's about being open and honest about this. You know, coming in there, there's going to be other people that, you know, that will be from Rochdale. We can't limit who we have in. However, the general public can't just walk in. It needs to be someone who is actually part of that service. And it's a free service. So I'm just going to tell you a bit about how we actually help people. So um, I dropped this presentation in Idara a while ago, and I know people were there, okay, well, what you actually do. Um, in, in the service. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we do, uh, or the support that we offer, firstly we have regular one-on-one -on -one, um, recovery sessions mm -hmm. and that's actually working with uh, a recovery worker. The recovery workers are normally people that are trained in some sort of psychosocial intervention. So it could be counselling, it could be um, CBT, NLP, any of these kind of techniques. And what they kind of do is sit down with that pe per the person who's, who's struggling and kind of assess the situation that they're in. They'll kind of build care plans around him, making sure that, you know, risk assessments, making sure that they're safe, firstly. Um, if there's any outbound referrals that the person needs, because we have people that are coming in from professional backgrounds, uh, we'll have people that are coming in just off the street that, that are pretty much homeless. And, you know, addiction is one of them things It doesn't discriminate, you know. The addiction doesn't discriminate. It will, it will, we, when we talk about an addict, we have this maybe image in our head of a, a guy on a park bench, in a, in a, you know, holding a paper bag, no, you have a high fi high flying professionals that are addicts, doctors, lawyers, okay, uh, people with really good sound jobs, accountants, and you'll have the whole, you know, the whole plethora coming in into high level. So it's not just you know people from homeless backgrounds or anything like this, but you have a vast variety of people, and they all have individual needs. Some people are struggling to to have a meal, okay, uh, daily, and they just need a hot place to come in, and some people are very well off. So any outbound referral, referrals that the, these people might need, okay? Uh, and it's a kind of a solution-focused solution uh, approach to any kind of problems that they might have. Um, and it's all about kind of changing the mindset towards how they view the addiction. Um, the other thing that we have is holistic therapies. Um, now, one of the things with, with, the, with the recovery is uh, an addiction is a quick fix. The addict gets caught into that, that I want it and I want it now. Type thing. But one of the things that they can't do is relax. Sometimes they use the addictions or the substances just to help them sleep at night. Um, so kind of switching off, winding down, all of these things are very difficult. Uh, and what we offer for that is holistic therapy. So it's kind of hot stone massages. Um, it's kind of therapeutic back massages, um, reflexology, different kind of things, guided meditation. Uh, we only do at high level, they only do the upper part of the body, okay? And they do the feet and reflexology. It's all about trying to get people to relax, um, but it is a service that we offer there. And it is free as well, and it's very popular. Um, the other one that we have is a counselling service. So the counselling service, obviously mental health assessments, um, teaching people coping strategies. Um, one of the things that I said to you mentioned, it's about upskilling people. So, you know, the, the adverse life circumstances don't go anywhere. You know, the challenges are always there. Um, it's the responses of the individual that we, that we look at changing. Okay, um, so it's kind of upskilling the individual of how to deal with adverse life circumstances. There's treatments for common mental health presentations. Okay, so we deal with a lot of trauma. There's a lot. All, I find it anyway that the um, a majority of the times uh, behind the addiction there's a trauma, and it could happen in childhood or whatever. But there's always, uh, you know, trauma somewhere involved in all that. Uh, and there's different kind of things like um, neuro linguistic programming, cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnotherapy, different kind of um, forms of, uh, of, of psychotherapy that are available. Um, group therapies, so we have this kind of like more individual work, but we do have work where people come together and it's kind of learning from each other. And these are kind of group therapies, so there'll be things like relapse prevention, and that's to how to ensure that the one thing is getting them off the addiction. The second thing is 
keeping them off the addiction. Um, one of the things that we know in in addiction, especially in the cycle of change, that a lapse, which is where the person goes back onto the substance, um, can be quite common, uh, and it's quite expected as well. And this is where, as a community, we lose our patience. Uh, you know, or as a family, we lose our patience. We just we just paid all this money to get him through rehab, and he's relapsed. Uh, but it it can it can actually happen. And these kind of groups, relapse prevention, is people sharing ideas and discussing how we can look at different factors of that and how we can avoid having potential relapses. There's a lot of things around personal development, so building confidence, self-esteem, all of these things, looking after our mental health, that are all integral parts. So there's a lot of work around that. Anger management, there's volunteer training, there's also acupuncture as well that they use, it's called um, auricular acupuncture around the ears. So it's helped to help, again, it's more focused around relaxation. Um, the activity groups, that a high level has and high level has a broad range of things okay and it they for the entire community but they have things like fishing arts and crafts groups yoga qigong which is like a bit like tai chi but it's breathing and relaxation relaxation and movement there's quizzes and games there's day trips where people go out they'll go you know here and there now you know obviously you know with people coming in from different areas i mean none of these things are compulsory upon anyone um, and every, you know, there's a, a plethora of services or loads of services that are available for people and you get to choose what you want, you know, you can choose. We will never ever kind of enfor force anyone to go take a particular thing, um, you know. So there's people obviously that are come from, um, you know, the, the faith-based perspective. They might not want or they might not want to adhere to anything. That's totally up to yourselves. But these are all services um, that are available and you know, they all benefit the individual and you can always choose. What high level tries to do is look at addiction from a holistic perspective. So it's kind of looking at not just giving out the knowledge or the just the kind of in the the dealing with the addiction, but the needs of that individual as well in his life, in his body, in his you know, in every aspect of him. Um, the other thing that high level has and it's very unique, okay, is that it offers support to concerned others and these are family members. Okay, so family members, friends of the person that's going through the addiction. Because like I mentioned right at the beginning, addiction is that kind of a tornado that it just leaves victims in its wake. The addict is hurting and he's using substances, okay, but then in turn, because that's all he has, all he has really is pain. He causes pain in the lives of other people that are around him. Uh, and people get hurt around him. And these people need the support as well, okay. Um, so that's kind of support for them but they can come in the service and they can access pretty much anything the same as as anyone else but we have separate groups for them which is normally on a wednesday evening around six o'clock um, and it's kind of them coming together peer groups where they can support each other as well uh, and they can look at how can they support the individual uh, it's kind of knowledge and enabling what are we doing are we actually from helping the individual to use or, or how are we contributing to the person or to that individual's using of, of, of substance and it's kind of looking at that it's looking at healthy healthy co help, healthy coping strategies for the individuals as well uh, how they can stop themselves from using or how they can look after themselves in the best manner educating them on addiction um, and it's peer-led support and it's signposting if they need any help or, or any kind of individual or specific help uh, is signposting them to where they can go high level northern trust also has a common room which is just kind of open all the time uh, it's normally nine o'clock to four o'clock, and it's a, just a drop-in community room. Um, like I mentioned, you know, we have various people from different backgrounds. Some people will just come in to stay warm. There's tea and coffee that's there pretty much all day. They can come in. There's lunches that are served for individuals who want to come in and have something to eat. Um, there's kind of regular activities, so it's always monitored the the common room. So there'll be someone in there if they just want to talk to them, if there's an issue that they have that needs deal with in, dealing with. Uh, if they need things like food vouchers or access to the food banks, you know, there's someone there to support them at all times. Um, so it's kind of a unique feature as well of high level that they have. How can the service be accessed? Um, basically, we have a website. It's called High Level Northern Trust um, in Rochdale. You can there's a, there's a referral link on that that can be filled in and sent in. Our referral process is very easy, it's very convenient. We normally turn around referrals really quick. Uh, from the day it goes in, probably by the next day, someone will be, the, the individual will be contacted 
and bought into the service. We, we work quite quick in there. Um, but also on social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Twitter is not as, as common, but Instagram and Facebook, definitely you can have a look at us. Um, there's obviously pictures up up there of some of the things, that are, some of the activities that we do. Um, so, you know, some of the activities we do and some of the things that we're actually doing, you can have a look at them. Um, we've started getting up on YouTube. <laughs> it's a slow process, <laughs> but it's happening. Um, so that's some of the ways that you can access the service as well. Uh, also, one of the things that we're doing is, um, with myself, I've actually been going through the Council of Moss. Um, what we have for the kind of future is, we didn't, I, didn't, I don't really want to come in and just do presentations and forget about it, okay? Um, so we're looking at long-term things of how, how we can support the community. Um, so hopefully that's going to be something that's actually turned around. There's something that I will be working with the imams with. There is kind of training courses that are in the pipelines um, just to kind of bring up the imams up to scratch on, on substance misuse um, that will hopefully be going ahead as well. But also things that are quite regular in the community, just focusing around uh, substances but mental health as well. Uh, and hopefully, inshallah, um, I might be back in the future if, if I get the opportunity. Something on mental health, something a bit more in depth, an area that I feel uh, I'm very passionate about. Um, but yes, if there's any questions, please do fire away and ask. Um, um, you, you, you mentioned that it was a worrying statistic to say that people have uh, got up to nine months to get access to help. Um, give me a correct me if I'm not um, interested in this correctly. Is it the service that you provide? Is there, is